Next speaker on the program, Mr. Keith Burgo. What I wanted to do is uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, thanks to the organizers. Uh, what we end up doing, the Open Adventure Network is, uh, is an entity that was formed 10 years ago in the wake of SCO, which was litigation that was uh, filed and supported and funded by uh, Microsoft on some, uh, uh, some Unix patents that were owned by a small company called SCO. And essentially, uh, IBM, Red Hat, Novell, Sony, NEC, and Philips got together and recognized that if they didn't do something, that there was potential that patents could slow or stall the progress of Linux and open source. And they recognized that their futures were inextricably bound with the availability of choice. Choice for, for vendors, choice for, for carriers, choice for, uh, for individual developers, coders. Uh, everyone should have the opportunity to, if they want to build around a platform, whether it's proprietary or open, they should have the ability to do so. Uh, we have no business model, we have no agenda. Um, we're well capitalized, but mainly because of the foresight of those companies and Google, uh, who more recently came in and contributed uh, to this activity uh, so that we could do a better job and, and live longer in terms of protecting Linux and, uh, and open source. Um, and so one thing that I think is, it was important for me when I came in to, uh, to lead this effort uh, eight years ago, it's the whole notion that the power is not so much in the, uh, in the technology that's produced or the code that's written, but it's in the modality. It's the idea that, that by building on each other's ideas, you know, the simple you know, humility-laden message that, uh, that was sent out 20 plus years ago by Linus uh, when he, uh, he invited and uh, encouraged individuals to build on what he, he put out there. I think the whole notion that one plus one plus one doesn't equal three anymore, it equals six or 10 or 20. We're able to distill the collective intelligence of creative people from all around the world. And what we're doing is, is merely to be part of the, the background. We're there to enable and ensure that, the, that individuals do have that opportunity to participate with each other and to, be, to express their cre creativity in a manner which yields a certain level of innovation. You think about projects, this is just a sampling of some of the projects the Linux Foundation is, is managing. And there are obviously hundreds of other projects if you look at SourceForge. Uh, some of these, though, are quite significant. Automotive grade Linux, Toyota has announced that they'll be uh, standardizing on, on that platform, and not just for the, uh, for the cabin of the future or the, uh, the, uh, the um, infotainment systems, but ultimately it'll be the digital DNA for all vehicles. Uh, and so what we, uh, Hyperledger essentially will transform the legal profession, will transform the accounting profession and payments globally. Those who don't participate run the risk of being disenfranchised through their own inaction because it's one of the fastest growing young projects which was launched in mid-December. Most money center banks uh, in North America and Europe are behind this. The Japanese banks are coming out in support of it and I expect the Chinese will participate as well. We've been talking about blockchain technology for some time in different environments of the world. I think people misunderstand blockchains not just about Bitcoin. It's just one, that's one manifestation, one application, but uh, blockchain supports this hyperledger kind of activity, which I think is incredibly important. So you have a whole variety of areas, the Internet of Things, represented Tizen, which is an alternative, uh, um, potentially mobile platform, uh, has got a lot of uptick, but they did launch a, a phone, a $39 phone in India uh, just about two years ago, uh, or a year ago, actually. And so, you look at the, the range of activities here, the cloud, the OpenStack's not on this list because they don't manage that project, but it's become more and more important that we think about how we manage projects and what we do when we kind of architect the project. And that's really what I want to talk about. Uh, my colleague, uh, Kevin, will talk a little bit more about, about OIN in particular, and I'll kind of run through some things, but I'll get to one slide and focus most of my discussion there. So we're really looking, you know, higher paced innovation. You know the story because you're participating in it on a daily basis. Um, we've got a, a basic notion that, that was the, the fundamental of what OAN was about, is that the idea that we cooperate and compete. Where we cooperate, we don't sue each other. Where we compete, 
all the normal rules apply. If you want to, if you're if in favor of patents, you can file patents. If you're not, we'd encourage you to file defensive publications to make sure nobody else can file on your ideas. It's a simple kind of, of activity and a simple notion uh, that uh, you know. There are unilateral and multilateral approaches. One multilateral, multi-party approach was OIM. The whole idea was foster, fostering community. It's not so much about the, the model itself, it's about what the model yields, which is the transformation of norms around how we behave toward each other. If the GPL provides a set of norms around how we look at copyright, <laughs> what we've done over the last 10 years and the architecting of this uh, with Free Software Foundation, SFLC uh, uh, contribution, was essentially to come up with something that worked in a similar way on the patent side. Developing a code of conduct and a set of norms. Um, the concepts, as I said, it's quite simple. You, we define what, what is core by soliciting nominations for packages from the community, understanding what's truly core in terms of how it's being utilized, and then we carve that area out and everyone that participates agrees that they're gonna not sue each other on the patents that they have and for, forbear litigation and provide a cross license. This is an indication of, of how we look at the packages. 80% of the packages of the 2200 packages that we have in this patent no-fly zone, <coughs> cooperation zone, are essentially common, common packages that come from the Linux kernel, system command programs, common libraries and setup tools, and then so, you know, the tools to essentially develop code uh, to write, to write our, uh, 11, make up 11%. So 90% of it is essentially fundamental building blocks of, uh, of open source. And then we've added enterprise computing, network security, uh, web, cloud computing, and mobile. Uh, we'll continue to move forward and be adding uh, core OS packages in the next two years, Chrome packages, Tizen packages, automotive created Linux, Linux packages, Hadoop, blockchain when it matures open daylight, which is software-defined networking, and Internet of Things packages. Uh, we're trying to make sure that there is significant use of these packages to ensure that we're properly uh, creating this patent no-fly zone in areas where people are truly committed to a certain functionality or technology. I highlight Asia in red because we've doubled in size two and a half times since 2012. We're the largest patent non-aggression community in the history of technology. And we've done this in a quiet, humble way because, as I said, it's the people in this room that are writing code, the people that are, that are putting their careers out there and they're, they're devoting their time, their energy, and their creativity to, to, to make this, to make open source a reality. These are the people that are, we consider to be the stars of the show. And we're there, again, in a support role to make sure that there's less friction in the, in the market so that people can actually participate and, and again, make choices. Asia is the, the largest growth area for us in that during this growth phase of two and a half times growth since 2012. Uh, Asia started out at 14 percent, so it's had a disproportionate percentage of growth. We spent a lot of time in India. Uh, I was just there two weeks ago uh, in Mumbai and in uh, Bangalore doing uh, legal network events where we bring lawyers together as well as business leaders from various companies. Uh, we had uh, um, Reliance Geo sign on behalf of the Reliance Group a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have a commitment from Wipro to, to join as well. Uh, and we're in advanced discussions with TCS and a number of other leading companies because they recognize that to, to, to not participate is essentially to be repugnant to the idea that we all need to be recognized that there's a win-win there, a when we all participate in this cultural norm. Uh, much like a permissive license or, or the participating in the GPL. So we, in order to encourage people to participate, we spend $95 million buying patents. We make all those patents available on a royalty-free basis, uh, and we encourage people to, uh, you know, to build around the, the, the content that we've de we we're delivering them in terms of the inventions. Uh, but mainly it's to inoculate people so that they're, the cross-license area that we require in return for access to our patents that's where, where the real value is, so that you can play freely and participate in the market freely. It's pro-competitive from an antitrust standpoint. I spend, I have regular meetings in, uh, with uh, Mofcom in uh, Beijing, with uh, DG Comp in Brussels, and with the U.S. Justice Department. I talk to, to officials all the time about how they can set up within their country programs and how projects should be, should be set up. And that's, again, what I want to talk about. We have, the companies that are part of our community have uh, over 1.5 million 
patents that they own, some significant percentage of those that, uh, that relate to the Linux system are uh, neutralized, if you will, um, and there's no cost to this. It's a global solution, as I said, it's not designed to be an American solution. Uh, in fact, the, the Americas represent uh, an appropriate position. Uh, we look to build up Asia to the point where it's 25 or 30 percent, reduce EMEA as a percentage, and then we'll probably have the right mix, which is a third, a third, a third. Um, as I said, it's royalty free. Um, this is just a sample of the kinds of companies that are in there, Ford Motor Company, Hyundai, Kia on the auto side, Meizu, uh, major uh, Chinese uh, seller of handsets, HTC, Fujitsu, uh, Docker, Docker early on in its existence uh, recognized that this was very important to do. They didn't look at it as a, a poison pill that would affect in any way, in neg a negative way, their ability to actually uh, go public and so they recognize, Dropbox recognized that, Twitter signed on before they went public as well. Um, Google as I said is a significant supporter as, as IBM is and, and Red Hat and a number of other companies um, and so Juniper, you know, it's, it really spans the, 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 uh, the spectrum of technologies and application areas in terms of the companies that are participating. There's major carriers like Verizon as well. Uh, essentially, the only reason that, that people don't join is that they want to reserve the right to sue on their patents. And uh, you start to self-select out, so after having you know, close to 1,975 participants, um, if you look at the InfoWorld articles that are written by, uh, uh, by Simon Phipps, even as recently as last week, he keeps basically you know, encouraging Microsoft to, base, to, to, take the, to pass the litmus test that he's established He's written three, three or four articles on this over the last 18 months. We will believe that you truly love Linux and that you're supportive of open source and it's not just a practical convenience that you're opening your platforms to open source once you sign the OAN license and you agree to, you agree to disarm. Uh, so essentially, quietly, we become uh, a macro <coughs> solution to be able to handle uh, patent on aggression, to neutralize threats and to reduce friction in the, in the environment so people can do what they do, which is create and not worry about FUD. Um, because I think when I first came into this eight years ago, there was still a fair amount of concern so that people were distracted. If you looked at uh, message boards, you looked at, at blogs, comment sections, you saw a lot of people focused on you know, the sky is falling, a lot of misinformation, a lot of concern in places that's counterproductive. And we want to keep that, you know, out of the public consideration and, and deal with these issues as they arise. We're constantly working with companies that are being attacked by patent trolls. We're working with companies to ensure that they have more prior art. We're writing defensive publications in key areas. We're buying patents and inventing on a regular basis. Um, as I said, we have the, the incredible luxury of not having a build business plan. If anything, I would call this an alternative return fund. The return is in making sure that there's freedom and choice and that that's preserved. Uh, my first career was as a diplomat, uh, where in the Cold War I felt I was uh, doing my part to make the world safe for democracy. This is like coming full circle in my career to make the world safe for the democratization of innovation. How we participate, how we engage with each other to create this new novelty that's really driving, driving us ahead as a, as a culture. Uh, and uh, as a community. Um, you have the OIN structure and I think what I'm, this is what I'm proposing to uh, those who manage significant numbers of projects. So I'm working, this is a work in progress and I want to introduce it to you here because this is, this is what I hope the projects of the future are as a complement to what OIN does. Projects need to become and project managers need to become more involved in looking at, at creating project-centric cross-licenses for platforms distributions, operating systems, uh, they need to recognize that they need to kind of mirror what OIN does but in a more granular way so that they're ensuring there's patent non-aggression. The people who come to a project to participate need to make a commitment that the patents that they own that read on, on what's core to that project are actually not going to use those patents. Um, right now we're in this uh, this hyper growth phase where we rush to projects because we're concerned about you know, new areas, new ways of innovating, and new to new application spaces. The reality is that we're not doing all the homework we should do in creating structures that are going to pre prevent us from having issues down the road because not all companies who participate in projects are, uh, I would say, authentic open source companies. There are some companies who are, um, 
I, I would describe as somewhat inauthentic and, uh, and concerning from my perspective. Uh, we see them all the time, we interact with them, and so we have a unique perspective probably uh, on this. And so what I'd like to do is prevent mischief by ensuring that there's a parallel micro solution in terms of a patent not aggression pact between participants in a project and that the project also manage uh, a process of creating defensive publications which are statements of prior art, they're not patents, they don't give you a negative right, they don't allow you to restrict access, which, any, which patents do. It essentially, essentially allows for the patent and trademark offices around the world to have access to the fact that you've invented something so no one else can ever get file on that invention. These are very low cost, they're three pages, they have a diagram and they have a summary. They don't have claims, for those of you familiar with what patents are. Um, so they're much easier to write and they're much less expensive to maintain. They're maintained on a single database. In fact, the, uh, I met with the, uh, the director, head of the Patent and Trademark Office in India two weeks ago, right before he announced the, the essentially reinforced the notion that software patents are not going to be part and parcel of the, of the, of the Indian uh, culture going forward. And in that, in that conversation, we committed I said, you're still not going to capture everything. You're still going to have patents, software that's enabled and labeled in hardware, software that sneaks through. The Europeans have a similar kind of approach and they still have 8%, 8 to 9% every year of software patents being granted. So the way to deal with this is, I, I described it as a proactive program where we're going to train the trainer, work with, with counsel at, at various companies around India, uh, work with private counsel as well, so that they can basically create a defensive publications program. He committed that he would set up a, a website that would sit on the desk of every patent examiner and that they would use it religiously to ensure that they're consulting these, these defensive publications and using them as prior art so that we can further limit the number of, of patents that ultimately get issued in that environment. It's very rare when you get to work with a clean slate, uh, but you know India represents that in a very unique way. Um, Pre-issue and submissions, this is a program that we were, we were the most active user in the world in an American program that came out of the American Vents Act where we attack and eliminate applications that are overly broad and we get the patent claim scope either reduced dramatically or we get the application rejected out of hand. Post-grant IPR, this is another activity where if you see that there are patents that already exist in the space that, that a project wants to inhabit, you basically go in and you have those patents rejected because they're overly broad. And so you essentially get a, a, a patent, uh, um, uh, have, it, uh, have, have it standing um, reduced to the point where it's, it no longer has, has validity. Uh, it's about patentable subject matter. And so you essentially, we, we attack existing patents, we attack pu published applications, we build publications as well so that we're, we're building this new sense of prior art to prevent people from getting patents. These are the things that I think in the, in the future we're going to see projects start to implement. Uh, central solutions to allow for the project to be more hygienic uh, and safer. Uh, just to close, there are a couple of other things that I think people look, need to look at. Unilateral pledges, companies that you're in, small, medium, large size companies, follow the lead of Google, Red Hat and, uh, and IBM in pledging non-aggression around patents that they own. And then there are other multi-party initiatives that even for very small companies can be quite, quite af affordable. Um, if for example, uh, a troll interdiction entity like RPX has RPX open. It's free to very small companies. Uh, Unified Patent, uh, um, they also provide a free program for, for small companies where they'll attack um, existing patents that are overly broad to try and get them to be uh, rejected. Um, by the tr patent and trademark offices around the world. Lot Network, which is an anti-privateering cooperative. Privateering essentially is when you take your patents as an operating company, you give them to a third party and they sue on your behalf, you share in the benefit. Um, that needs to stop. That's a program that, that uh, Google actually pioneered. Uh, and Proactive Patents does the uh, pre-issue and submissions that I talked about. So thanks very much. Yes. That's okay. I got a question. It was brief. Yeah, go ahead. Can you just go back uh, one slide? Uh, sure. And then, uh, there is Mozilla creating license or something. So, 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 uh, hey, excuse me? Mozilla issued a license. Sorry. Mozilla issued a license uh, for uh, 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 spreading, uh, pre preventing patents. Something like uh, rights granting to a given kind of license last year. 
Mozilla. Yeah, yeah. It's licensed on most Mozilla. Oh, Mozilla. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, I think Mozilla is trying to get people to, you know, it's like any anyone. I think they're trying to be right thinking and put something out there that encourages more neutralization of threat. And we see these all, all these activities that I'm describing are complementary. Um, and that's why, you know, I talked about Google's, you know. And over the last five years, Google has introduced a whole series of things. In addition to joining OAN as a full member, they've introduced a whole series of things because you, you have to kind of step up and have a leadership position in this area. That's what Mozilla is doing in Mark. We are part of OAN network, and I'm also with SFRC Routing Advisory Board. So yeah, that's so closely associated. Yeah. Yeah, my, my question. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah. Um, I, I guess there are two parts to the one. One is the first part is the uh, the, the East Texas uh, court. Uh, yeah. What can anything right. be done about that? Uh, you know what we do when when it's a typical troll venue for those who aren't aware, um, where patent aggregators will file multiple uh, litigations at, uh, at one time simultaneously. Um, you know, I think a lot's actually happening over because the Alice ruling. The Alice ruling has eliminated what is, or re reduced a lot of the patents that are out there already to the point where they're 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 not enforceable because they have uh, patentable subject matter uh, issues that are that are critical and uh, um, and so they've been there've been in record numbers of uh, of IPRs where existing patents on Alice grounds are being uh, essentially rejected. Uh, they're being invalidated. And then uh, new patents are being, the patent numbers are down in the US. Uh, you know, it's actually a part of the trend over the last three or four years. The other place where patent numbers are up significantly in China because they didn't get the memo. And so they're, they're moving in a direction where they, it's expected in 2018 they'll have 900,000 patent applications, uh, which is, uh, Moving I mean, as what I would say is counter. It's counterintuitive considering where everybody else in the world is going to higher quality and uh, and uh, fewer numbers of uh, patents being filed. So I think there's a significant reduction in patent threat in the U.S. markets because of uh, legislative reform in terms of the American Vents Act now having a, a few years to be effective, and because of uh, of the the courts and being able to hear cases that give them good options to be able to carve back uh, what is patentable and to reduce the scope of, uh, of, uh, of what, uh, you know, what, the effect of, of software patents in the marketplace. We try not to get into the you know, debate, should software be patentable or not patentable? We just try to work in environments where people are looking for impact, <coughs> for, for input, like you know, with the, uh, the Indian uh, regulator to make sure that, uh, that they have information that, that we collect from around the world, and SFLC, you know, basically put together the platform that uh, that was ultimately adopted by the government, which we thought was quite a good uh, re reflection of how you know government solicits input and is able to sort and sift between ideas and, and come up with a, a positive, you know, understand positive recommendations versus you know noise. Uh, my second one would be: Have you spoken to the the, the intellectual property officer here in Singapore? No. I, I think we need that because um, they just don't. We don't have software patents in our system here, uh, but at the same time, they are not keen to specifically put it in there like what India has uh, sort of done in terms of saying no software patents. Um, so I think we probably need help from OIN to probably engage with the IPOS in Singapore to. You know, we're we're you know we're a resource, and that's how we view ourselves. We're happy to talk to. You know, government organizations. We we actually we've been working with the Chinese to patent trademark office to adopt a defensive publication program, which they instituted about four months ago, five months ago, and they've been uh, accepting publications and, and as they recognize themselves, even though the central government has a big push on for patenting, they recognize this is not terribly productive. So they're trying to reduce ultimately what's patentable. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. And, uh, Thank you very much for your good questions. Thank you. Oh. Thanks again, Keith.